everyone. Grace be unto you from God our Father and from His Son, Jesus Christ. I want to take this moment to invite you to our morning worship. Thank you for joining us uh, online, YouTube, our uh, website as well, and also Facebook and any other means whereby you've been able to get online to join us. I want to thank all of you for inviting others to join us for worship. Uh, thank you for supporting us with your presence and also with your attention. I trust that you will be blessed with our service today. I also want to thank all of our members who will join us who in, in prayer, continue to pray for us. Uh, Brother Michael, Dick, and Garner, thank you for working the music and also for the sound room for us and making us making sure that we are heard. We, God, we say God bless you uh, for your labor of love. I ask that you'd continue to pray for us. We seem to be uh, in the spike again with this pandemic, and uh, we are hoping and praying that um, God would visit with us in such a gracious and powerful way um, that we'll be able to get on top of this uh, pandemic that we're in. Pray for the new vaccines that are out, or rather coming out, rather pray for their approval, and also pray that they will uh, be a difference maker and getting ahead of this plague that we have been going through for the last eight months or so. Also, I ask that you continue to pray for our reopening committee. For those of you who are looking forward to our November meeting for our reopening committee meeting, I'm going to let you know that that meeting for this month is canceled. We will not be doing the reopening committee meeting. So for those of you who are hearing me and on that committee, you will know that that meeting has been canceled uh, for this month. Well, with that being said, we want to uh, turn our attention to our scripture this, this morning. I want to read a passage of scripture to you, have a word of prayer, and then we'll just dig in uh, with the word of God. Our scripture today is taken from 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 4, uh, reading through verse 10, and then we'll have a word of prayer. Hear the reading. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God, and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For the scripture, for in the scripture it says, See, I lay in Zion a chosen and precious cornerstone. The one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stones the builders, or rather the builders rejected, has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobeyed the message, or rather disobeyed the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, the people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. For once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received the mercy, but now you have received mercy. The reading of God's word to the hearers, we ask that you'd be blessed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for the word of truth. You are the living God. You are the ruler of heaven and earth. You are the one who gives life and breath to all of us. And so we want to just take a moment to worship you and give you praise. Thank you for another opportunity to worship you. Thank you for consciousness. Thank you for the thought process. Thank you for even to know that we are who we are. And thank you for the opportunity to worship you with a spirit of praise and thanksgiving. Thank you for the song that they can gonna play for us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the reading of your scriptures. Thank you for the visitation and moving of your Holy Spirit. We come now to the preaching of the word, and we ask that you'd visit with us, give us the enabling power of your Holy Spirit. Speak through us and to us that we might understand the principles of your word, but not only that, inspire us, O oh God, that we might be able to apply your word. God, we pray that you'd move every distraction every sin that so easily beset us so that we can run with patience the race that is set before us. God, we pray that you'd help us to be the people that you've called us to be. We pray that you'd save those who are lost, bring back to ones who have strayed away. 
God, we pray that you strengthen our witness. Help us as a group of believers to be strong in our witness. Pray, God, that our witness might be persuasive, that it might be winning, that it will make bring people to attention of who you are, that people will get saved. Now, God, we pray that you'd build us up in the faith, strengthen our witness, protect us, oh God, as we seek to worship and serve you in these very hopeless and disturbing times. We pray that you'd give us the hope that we need to get through this stretch of wilderness where this pandemic seemed to be out of control. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Let us all say amen. Well, good morning again to everyone. We are just so glad that you're here and uh, we just hope that you can um, join us and invite others to join us um, we also want to say, if you want to become a member of our church, um, we also have a way to do that. You can call the church office, and we will put you in touch with one of our leaders who will walk you through the process. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, now is the time um, to do it. Well, tomorrow is not promised to us. Today is the day of salvation. So I encourage those who have never invited Christ in uh, to do it, even today. Boy, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Well, the message I want to talk to you about for the next few minutes is celebrating our identity in Christ. Celebrating our identity in Christ. We are God's chosen people. The scripture passage says we are royal priesthood. We've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are the people of God. We are the redeemed. And I think that ought to be celebrated. I think that's worth celebrating. We are privileged people, brothers and sisters in Christ. God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I think we ought to celebrate who we are. I think we ought to celebrate our identity in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, we celebrate all kinds of stuff. We celebrate birthdays. We, we celebrate basketball games. We, we just celebrate all kinds of, but, but there's nothing more important than celebrating our identity in Christ. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, we are the called out ones. We are the chosen ones. We are the ones that God has chosen to call out of darkness into his marvelous light. The passage before us helps us or show us how we can get excited about this, 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 this topic that I've just been sharing with you to, to, to celebrate our identity in Christ. It will help us to get excited about who we are and what God has called us to do. So that's why I want you to pay attention to this text as we get into it today, and I trust that it will help you get excited about who you are in Jesus Christ. This text starts off with a statement about Jesus Christ. If you read the passage carefully, you'll discover that the Apostle Peter is talking about Jesus. He says, you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. In this passage, Jesus is described by Peter as the living stone. What are stones for? Stones are used in, 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 in uh, all kinds of uh, uh, cultures and society. They're used for the purpose of building building a house, building a shelter, building a framework. Well, Jesus came to the earth to build something. He came to the earth to build the kingdom of God on earth. Is that right? He came to set up the kingdom of God in the hearts of men, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of righteousness in the heart of men. All of the preaching and teaching that he did was directed to that end. Jesus came to build the kingdom of God. He came to set up the kingdom of God in the hearts of men. Is that correct? Yes, he did. That was his ministry. That was his preaching, his teaching. That was his heart was about, was to set up the kingdom of God in the hearts of the human family. Now, we know he came to die for the sins of man. That's the reason why he went to Calvary's Hill. That was the reason why he, he paid the sacrificial debt for our sins. That's why he went in and bled for us. He died for us. We know that. That was ex ex essentially a, the purpose why he came to die for our sins. But let's not miss or lose sight on the fact that not only, Jesus did, not only did Jesus 
come to, to this earth to die for our sins and make us right with God. He came to set up God's kingdom in our hearts and the hearts of men. He is the living stone. He is the living stone. He came to build the kingdom of God in the hearts of men. This passage also tells us that not only did Jesus come to set up God's kingdom in the hearts of men, but he was rejected. Are you listening to me, brothers and sisters? Peter says he was rejected by men. He was rejected by both men and women. He was rejected by mankind. The prophet Isaiah says it this way in Isaiah 53, verse 3. He says he was despised, rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like, whom, like one from whom we hid our faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Yes, Jesus Christ was rejected by men. That was true in his day, and that's also true in our day. He was rejected by the Pharisees. He was rejected by the Pharisees. He was rejected by the religious leaders of his day. Yes, not only was Jesus rejected in his day, but he was, he's, also, he was, he's also rejected in our day, and he will continue to be rejected until he come back again to establish God's full kingdom on earth. Regardless of how good God was and sending his son, regardless of how good Jesus was when he lived his life on earth, people still reject him. Our culture, our culture, our culture has turned its back on God. Now you just all you have to do is watch TV or listen to that, or listen to uh, a, 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 look, look, a, a view a movie. All you know, uh, uh, look at what happens in our society. You will know that our culture has turned its back on God. Jesus Christ is rejected by men, men of our day. The gay rights movement, the gay rights movement, is a great sign of his rejection. We know what God's Word says about the sanctity of marriage. The, 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 the God's, God's Word that has said that a marriage should be between a man and a woman. The Lord established that in Genesis chapter 2, Adam and Eve, the first couple. There is nowhere in Scripture where the Lord says same-sex marriage is okay, but our culture says okay. Our culture, our laws have been passed and said this is okay. This is okay. This is okay. Brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to tell you that our culture has turned its back on God. Not only with regards to that particular area of disobedience, but in all kinds of disobedience, our, our, our human family has turned its back on God and we are in dire need for repentance. Yeah, yeah. Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, has been rejected by men. He is the living stone. He is the one who came to set up God's kingdom in our lives, and yet people have turned their backs on him. He is the one who came to give us nothing but goodness, and we have still turned our backs on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But brothers and sisters, he is still precious. Yeah, no matter how we turn our back on him, Jesus Christ is precious. And then that's what Peter talks about in this passage, that he is the precious stone. He is precious to us. He is precious to every generation. I, I would like to say this of him. He is more valuable than silver and gold. Nothing we can desire can be compared to him. Our relationship to Jesus Christ is the most valuable relationship that anyone could have. His counsel, his good counsel, his, his provision, a good provision. The Lord will not withhold any good, uh, good thing from those who trust in him. Yes, our relationship with Jesus Christ is the most precious relationship that we could ever achieve. And yet, yet people have turned their backs on him. Well, this brings us, this brings us to the core, brings us to the core of our message that we have before us. Not only is Jesus a precious cornerstone, not only Jesus is a precious living stone, but we are like living stones as well. And it also gives us a reason why we should celebrate our identity as believers in Christ. Let me take you back to verse 5. This is what Paul says in our text. 
this is what Peter rather says in our text. Peter, not Paul, Peter says in our text. He says, you also like living stones are being built up into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Let me just read that again because this is what Peter says about us. Now we're talking about what he said about Jesus. He says, Jesus Christ is a living stone. He came to, he came to build the kingdom of God in the hearts of men. But let's talk about what he's saying about us now. In verse 5, he says, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Well, because of our relationship to, to Jesus Christ, because we have accepted him as our personal Savior, because we are surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives, we too have become like living stones. Turn to your neighbors as neighbor, we are like living stones. Yeah, we are like living stones. In other words, we are like the house of God. When I drive down the streets of Emerald, when I drive down the streets of 107th Street and I see this building on the corner, I, I, I'm reminded about the, the people of God in this community. Somebody go to that church. Somebody go to that ministry center. Somebody go to that place to worship. And so this building that I see uh, made out of mortar and brick, uh, th this building reminds me of God. Well, that's what believers ought to do for our world today. In other words, we ought to be a visible reminder of the presence of God. We ought to be a visible reminder of who God is and what he wants us to do. I am excited about the fact that God has, God has promised to live inside of us. God has promised to reflect himself through us. And so when people see me, when people see us as believers, they ought to be interacting with someone who can remind them that we have a living God, that God lives inside of us. Yes, we are living stones. We are like a living house. In other words, the, the, the one advantage that we have over the, 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 the fixed building here, this building can't move, but we can move from place to place. We can go from society to, uh, to, to society. We can go to culture group to culture group, and we can represent Jesus Christ wherever we go because we are living stones. We are a living house, and people ought to be reminded of God when they interact with us. The temple in the Old Testament was a massive structure. It was beautiful. It was a great place to behold. It was a place where people came from far and near and prayed. The Lord had promised to answer the prayers of people who prayed in that place, not just the Jews, but other people who came and prayed at the temple. Yeah, it was a place where people made sacrifices to God. It was a place where people were reminded of God. It was a place where people renewed their covenant relationship with God. Yes, the temple was that kind of place. Well, we are called to be living temples. We are called to be living houses. We're called to be a, a living places where people can re be reminded of the place of God. This brings me to a very important point. I wonder, can people see Christ in his church today? There is so much racism and division and discrimination in our world today that I believe the church has an excellent opportunity to reflect, to exhibit um, the presence of the living God. Red and yellow, black and white. If we are believers, people ought to be able to see and sense that we are connected with Jesus Christ they ought to be able to see and sense that, 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 that we won't let race separate us. We won't let culture separate us. We won't let politics separate us. But we will reflect the presence of God wherever we are. That is the task of the church today. That's why the church is so important to our society. The Lord says you are the salt of the earth. The Lord says you are the light of the world. In other words, when people see us interacting with one another and see us interacting with the world, they ought to be reminded of Jesus. I, I, I think that we would have a much better world if the church would be the living stones that God has called it to be and reflect 
the image and presence of Jesus Christ. Well, I know, I know, I know that all of us could take some improvement in that area, but I think that the church has a very awesome task to represent Jesus Christ in a world that is so divided. That's the choice. We have to make that choice. But there's another reason I think that uh, uh, we should celebrate who we are in Christ. Not only has the Lord called us to, to, to represent him, to be reflectors of his presence, he's called us to deliver an important message. Are you still with me? I don't want you to go to sleep on me because this is a real important message. We, we, are in, we should celebrate who we are because God has called us to reflect his presence. But we should celebrate who we are because God has called us to deliver his message. Listen to what Peter says in verse 9 and 10. But you are chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This passage is so rich in information, so, so rich in what the Lord has left us here to do. We are God's chosen people. God has selected us to represent him. God has selected us to be his ambassadors. God has selected us to tell people who he is and what he wants them to know. The function of the priest in the Old Testament, and they were a special class of people. They served at the tabernacle. They served at the temple. They prayed for the people. They taught the people about God. They offered sacrifices for the sins of the people. They made people conscious of God. They were like a go-between, even the high priest who went behind the altar and offered the, the atonement offering once a year. The priests were special people in the presence of God. Well, I think the church also are special people in our society. I'm not talking about just the clergy. I'm, I'm not talking about just the preacher alone, but I'm talking about the church family. I'm talking about the household of God, the ecclesia, the called out ones, the church of the living God. We are entrusted with a very awesome task. And Jesus Christ made all of this possible through his death on the cross. He made it possible for us to be living priests. And that's an, in other words, in the Old Testament, the priests only came from the tribe of Levi. But when Jesus went to the cross, it says that the veil that hid the Holy of Holies was torn in sunder. And that means that Jesus Christ has made it possible for each one of us to approach the throne of grace in Jesus' name for one another. So that simply means that I can be your priest and you can be my priest. You can pray for me and I can pray for you. I can talk to you about Jesus Christ and you can talk to me about Jesus Christ. You can encourage me in the faith and I can encourage you in the faith. I can be your priest. Why? Because the Lord has given us the authority to do that. We don't have to be born from the tribe of Levi. We are the Lord's priesthood. We're a holy nation. Well, I think we ought to celebrate that. I think that we ought to celebrate who we are in Christ. I think we ought to celebrate what the Lord has called us to do. Are oh, you still with me? Yeah? Anyone cannot get excited about that? You are missing something. Anyone can get, cannot get excited about who we are in Christ and what the Lord had called us to do. Um, I think something is missing in your thinking. Let me push this one step further. The Lord has is called us to declare the message of salvation. He has called us to declare a saving message. That's our mission, you all. That's what God has ta told us to do. That's what God has commissioned the, us to do. A few weeks ago, I preached on this, but let me just go back and review some of the things I've said. 
In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the Lord says, You shall be my witnesses, he's talking to those first disciples now, in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then he goes on in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, and says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of age. In this text, Peter echoes that same thought. He says, hey, look, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare, that you may proclaim, that you may proclaim the excellences of his praises. In other words, the Lord wants us to preach the gospel. He wants us to declare the gospel. He wants us to talk about the fact that we've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. That is a message that the world needs to hear. And that is a message that God has given the church to share. He's called us to share an important message. What a privilege. Brothers and sisters, what a privilege. The Lord has given us the most important message. He's given us the greatest story that's ever been told. He has given us a, the, the, the commission to share a message that will get people's lives right. Yeah, the Lord has given us a very precious message, a message more precious than gold. He's given us a message that changed people's lives. He's given us a message that called people from darkness and get them on the road to eternal life. He's given us a message that make families better. He's given us a message that make marriages better. He's given us a message that will make schools better. He's given us a message that will help us live at the highest level of what we've called to be what we're called to live while we're on this side of eternity. Well, if God has done all of that, then I think we ought to celebrate, don't you? I think we ought to celebrate. Now, now, now this leaves us with a few other things I want to say in this message. If the Lord has made us a kingdom of priests, if he's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, if he's given us a message that will make people lives better, if he wants us to celebrate that message, how do we do that? How do we do that? If I ended this sermon here, then I would leave you hanging. I want to talk about how we have to celebrate who we are and what God has called us to do. Again, I'll say it again. I want us to talk about for a few minutes how we celebrate who we are and what the Lord has called us to do. Are you still with me? I certainly hope you, you are. Well, here's the answer of how we celebrate who we are and what God has called us to do. Well, let me take you back to Revelation 5. You know, in Revelation 5, it starts off with the fact that, that, that a plan of redemption had not been found, and, and then the Apostle John starts to cry. And throughout this chapter, we find that the progress is where a, a plan of redemption had a plan of redemption was found for the human family, and it was announced in this passage. And when the plan of redemption was found in this passage and announced, so he says, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, and midriths and midriths of angels rejoiced. In other words, they were jubilant that a plan of salvation had been discovered for the human family. And then he goes on to say, all the creatures in heaven and on earth, the angels which could not be numbered rejoice. Well, this gives us a great example of how we should celebrate our identity in Christ. We should celebrate it with rejoicing. In other words, we should celebrate it with excitement. There should be all kinds of excitement in our hearts because we are part of the family of God. We should join the angels. We should join the shepherds on, on fields of Palestine. We should rejoice because our eternal destiny has been changed. Yeah, we rejoice with excitement, with a gladness, because our God cared enough for us to send the best gift that he had. That was the gift is his son. And because Jesus Christ obeyed his father to the fullest, 
our destination changed. We became sons and daughters of God, headed to heaven. Because of this, we ought to rejoice. In other words, there ought to be a joy that fill our spirit. There ought to be a happiness. There ought to be a celebration that fill our spirit that nothing can begin to rival on earth. You, you know, you know um, even during this pandemic, we, we had a few teams who played. We had the NBA teams who played, and, and uh, Los Angeles Lakers won the championship. And we got people now playing football and hoping that one of them will also win and the championship. But well, well, here's the thing, brothers and sisters. When those carnal, when those calm victories are won, when those calm victories are won, uh, the, 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 the conquerors celebrate. Not only does the, the, the team celebrate, but all of the city celebrate, and even some people who are not a part of the city celebrate. A carnal victory that probably won't be remembered in a hundred years. What about the fact that we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. What about the fact that we are now God's chosen people? What about the fact that the righteousness of Jesus Christ is now credited to our account? What about the fact that we are on the road to eternal life? What about the fact that we serve someone who is even able to deal with this virus that we're suffering through? I think that's worth celebrating. I think we ought to have a grand celebration, thanking God that the Garden of Eden was not the end of our fate. Calvary's Hill opened the door to eternal life. Well, let me move you to the next reason, next, the next measure of how we can celebrate. We can celebrate by continuing the work that God has called us to do with an attitude of joy and an attitude of praise. Now, let me, let, let me just sort of expound on that, that, that for just a few moments. Because, you know, sometimes when we, when we do the work of the Lord, we don't, we don't do it with a joyful spirit. I, I'm reminded when I was growing up, I grew up in the South many years ago, and, and I, I grew up on the farm, and we had many chores to do. And, and some of the time, my mother would ask me to do something that I didn't want to do. Now, I knew that if I didn't do it, I was in trouble with her, and I did it anyway, but I didn't do it with a joyful spirit. I, I, I did it with, you know, some kind of chagrin or regret that, that, you know, this is wash day and I'm going to have to make sure I get enough water for my mom. Well, I'm saying to you is that we can celebrate who we are in Christ by doing the work of the kingdom, not with a, 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 a sad spirit, but with an excited spirit with a joyful spirit. In other words, with a gladness. In other words, we are glad to do it. We are glad to be a part of the movement, and we do it with a sense of excitement. We can celebrate who we are in Christ by continuing the work with a sense of gladness. In other words, when it comes down to giving our offering, when it comes down to giving our task, we can do it with a sense of gladness to knowing that we can't be God-giving no matter how hard we try. We can do the work of the kingdom with a sense of gladness. That's another way of celebrating who we are in Christ. And then finally, we can celebrate who we are in Christ in our worship. I love this. We can celebrate not only in our work, but in our worship. Somebody ought to say amen. Listen to what the psalmist said in Psalms 100. He says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. In other words, make a joyful noise. In other words, in other words let people hear you rejoice. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Uh, come before him with singing. Come before him with letting your lips move. Come before him with singing songs. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. He is the one who made us. He is the one who put us to bed at night. He is the one who get us up in the morning. He is the one who saved us through Jesus Christ. We can celebrate that you are. We are his people. We are the works of his hand. Not only by creation, but we are the works of his hand through redemption. We are the sheep of his pasture. And now we can celebrate by entering into his courts with thanksgiving, by entering into his church with praise. Well, you said, Father, pray the church is closed. Oh, no. That church house might be closed, but the church is you. Uh-huh. Yeah, we can praise God in spite of the church being closed. 
We can be thankful to him. We can bless his name. Yeah, for he is good. And his mercy is not just short-lived. His mercy is just not tomorrow. His mercy, his mercy endures forever. Lord, we can celebrate that in our worship, in our praise, in our thanksgiving. Well, let me give a closing comment. We are God's people. The Lord has called us out of the world of darkness into his marvelous light. God has given us a powerful message to share with the world that will change lives. I don't know about you, but we ought to celebrate that. We ought to reflect upon the goodness of God and celebrate that. We ought to celebrate upon, the, we ought to reflect upon who we are in Christ and celebrate that. We ought to reflect upon this important message that God has given us to share with the world and celebrate that. We ought to celebrate in our work or to celebrate in our worship. I trust that something has been said today will bless your heart. I trust that you will go out and celebrate who you are in Christ. We're living in a world where there's much sadness, where there's much chagrin, where there's much grumbling, and there's much discontentment. But I want believers to know, Christians, I want you to know that you have something to celebrate you can celebrate your identity in Christ. You can celebrate the fact that God has called you. Now, if there's somebody been listening to me for the last 20, 30 minutes and have never received Christ as your personal Savior, I'm going to ask that you do this with me. I'm going to ask that you to invite Christ into your life as I pray. And I want you to call us up, 773-568-3200, or you can call me personally, 708 275 9594 and we're going to talk about your relationship with the Lord let's pray father we do thank you for the privilege of prayer thank you Heavenly Father for this opportunity to worship you even though the sanctuary is empty we know that it's full because we know that there are people listening all over the world and we know Heavenly Father that there's somebody out there who need to know you as their personal Savior we pray that they would invite you in for if they ask you to come in, you will come in and you will turn the light on. You will forgive them for their sins. You will write their names on the Lamb Book of Life and you will credit the righteousness of your son to their account. And so, Lord, I pray that there were no one listening to my voice I would leave this worship occasion without having a relationship with you. Lord, thank you again for the men who came early to help me with this message. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who put it on my heart. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who preached through me today. And I pray that we'd go down from this place celebrating who we are in Jesus Christ. Pray this in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, that is the end of our message for today. We do invite you to join us again as we gather. We trust that something was said that will help you in your walk with the Lord. And we certainly hope that you will enjoy the rest of the day. May the Lord bless you until we meet again. Now unto him who's able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his own glory with exceeding joy, the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, now henceforth and forevermore. Let us all say amen. God bless you, saints.